You know, there are over 17 million people in the world today that experience depression. That means they experience darkness for a period of at least two weeks. And that's tough. When you're going through darkness like that and depression, you don't see a way out. But I want to tell you something. We have a way maker, and he is the light in the darkness. I want you to stay with us today as we're, we're going to learn some techniques. These are biblical principles on how to overcome depression. Now, I'll say up front, I'm not a professional therapist. I cannot tell you exactly how to overcome depression. There are professionals out there. There are doctors. There are therapists. There are counselors that can help you. And I would encourage you, if you're facing depression, that you see someone who can guide you and who can help you. But I will say this from a spiritual perspective, that God only knows. He knows what you're facing. He knows what you're going through. He knows the sadness that you experience. His son Jesus also went through sadness and despair and darkness. But you know, it's Mother's Day weekend, and I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge this special day. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a few moments now to do that. But for some, motherhood isn't possible. It's not biologically possible, and they can't have a child, so it can be depressing. For some, their mothers weren't all that nice, and they had an estranged relationship from their mother. And so Mother's Day isn't a joyous occasion, and there may be some depression there, some sadness. For some, they've lost their mothers, and they're sad. And this occasion, this Mother's Day weekend, reminds them that they no longer physically have their mothers with them, their, their grandmothers. And so they could be experiencing sadness right now. There's an old Facebook post that one of my former youth, Caitlin Sullivan, if she's watching right now, she's a young adult now, she posted this several years ago about mothers. This is what I had to say. My mom, at age 16 years, my mom is so annoying. At 18 years old, I'm leaving this house. At 25 years old, mom, you are right. At 30 years old, I want to go to mom's house. At 50 years old, I don't want to lose my mama. At 70 years old, I would give up everything to have my mom with me right now. You know, if you have your mom, you still have her, appreciate her, love her. If you're estranged from her, reach out to her, go see her, contact her. There is a way. You know, someone has made a, a list of things that mothers would never say. Maybe you've seen this list. See if your mom would ever say these things. How on earth can you see the TV sitting so far back? Yeah, I used to skip school a lot. Just leave all the lights on. It makes the house look more cheery. Let me smell that shirt. Yeah, it's good for another week. Go ahead and keep that stray dog. I'll be glad to feed it and walk him every day for you. Well, if Timmy's mom said it, it's okay. Then it must be okay then. You know, the curfew, it's just a general time to shoot for. It's not like I'm running a prison around here. I don't have a tissue. Just use your sleeve. Don't bother wearing a jacket. The wind chill is bound to improve. <laughs> you know, somebody's got to take care of us, right? And usually that falls to mom. One of my favorite gospel stories is one you just heard read. It's the two disciples that are they're leaving Jerusalem following Jesus' crucifixion. And they're traveling to Emmaus, which is a town, a village, about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. Their hearts have been crushed. Their hopes and their dreams had been destroyed. Depression was setting in. Jesus had been crucified, their master, their teacher, their best friend. You know, how do we respond to a love that breaks our hearts? A dating relationship? You've been dating that person for a while. You spent a lot of money on them. You think it's going somewhere. Maybe you're ready to pop the question. And then they say to you, let's just be friends. A wayward child, an unfaithful spouse, the promise of a raise or promotion goes sour. You remember Clark W. Griswold in Christmas Vacation? He's expecting to get that raise, and so he's already made a deposit on the swimming pool that he wants to get for the family. He spent a lot of money. 
And so when the courier comes to the door with an envelope, he thinks it's the raise he's been longing for. He takes that envelope into the house and he opens the envelope and his whole family's there for Christmas and he looks at it. And it's a gift of a jelly of the month club. That's what he gets. And he goes over to the eggnog and he's looking at the card, the letter or whatever, and he's taking that eggnog. Mm, it's so good, it's so good. And then he explodes because he didn't get what he expected. You know, most of us can relate, can't we? We take the risk of allowing ourselves to get caught up in a vision of hope only to have our hearts broken time and time again. And moms can certainly relate. Now, here we have these two disciples. You know, they're, they're sharing in this great hope. They, they believe Jesus is the Messiah. And then all of a sudden, they just lose it all because they've witnessed his death. And even though Jesus told them what was going to happen, they still could not grasp the resurrection because they hadn't witnessed him rise yet. And so they searched their minds and their hearts only to discover how it could have happened, how it could have been prevented. Surely there was another way. You know that feeling of loss, don't you? That shoulda, coulda, woulda stage in life. But for the disciples and probably you too, there's no other way. And what the disciples have witnessed is not failure, but a necessary and inevitable part of furthering God's reign, a reign larger and broader than they can possibly fathom. You know, fear sets in when we think we've lost hope. To feel fear is not unusual, and it's sometimes it's necessary. It can be a life-saving experience for us. Fear alerts us to the dangers that could harm us. However, when fears dictate all our actions, we can become paralyzed and incapable of thinking clearly or living faithfully. As we learned a few weeks ago, the disciples, they were victims of their own fears. They were locked behind these closed doors, and when Jesus appeared to them, they couldn't believe it. Once the reality of his living presence was clear, their fears gave way to courage. They could do anything. Jesus is here. He's the way maker. Ever since Jesus appeared to the disciples, Christians have discovered there's no need to fear or be anxious or worry when we're in the presence of God. To walk with God not only rebukes our fears and sends them away, but it also increases our courage and our confidence. God was walking side by side, the two disciples to Emmaus, and they didn't even know it. To walk with God is to be reassured of direction and guidance and strength for our daily journey. What do we have to fear when we're in God's presence and care? Nothing. Nothing at all. Now, this doesn't mean that we're going to be spared discouragement and disease or death itself. It does mean that we will never be alone. It means that you will be given the strength to meet the demands of your daily life. It means that you will know the joy and hope of living in the presence of God in every single circumstance that life throws at you, including a pandemic. Are you overwhelmed? Are you stressed? Are you worried? Are you anxious? Are you depressed? Are you grieving? He will give you courage and strength and hope if you will walk with him. He is more than enough. You know, these two disciples were joined by one that they thought was a stranger. He asked them what they were discussing, and they replied, Are you the only one in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? Well, there is much more to the story, including their discovery that it's Jesus who has joined them. But here's the point, and it is an assumption which we all make, that everyone is caught up in what we're caught up in. We assume that others have had the same experience that we've had, that they know the same things we know. The truth is that those around us may be living in a totally different world than we are in now. As I mentioned earlier, there are people walking around us all the time, even under our roof that are experiencing depression. Over 17 million in the U.S. alone have at least one depressive episode that lasted for at least two weeks. Depression is an enemy. It's your enemy. It's also something you didn't ask for. You didn't ask to be depressed and sad. You didn't ask for that. 
It can steal your joy. It can steal your peace. It can become a cloud that casts a shadow over everything in your whole life. Depression dulls your senses and causes you to view every every area of your life through a dark filter. It can take you down the road of despair and discouragement that only leads to worry and fear and hopelessness. I have been down that road. I know, my friends. It's not fun whatsoever. Major depression is one of the most common mental disorders in the United States. For some folks, major depression can result in severe impairments that interfere and limit your ability to carry out life activities, just to do everyday things. You don't feel like doing it. You don't feel like getting out of the bed. You don't feel like eating. You don't feel like being around people. It's a struggle for some folks every single day and no amount of medication, no amount of counseling seems to do anything but confuse them even more. It is a reality for folks. And with all this isolation that we're experiencing, depression is likely to increase as well as suicide attempts and cases. Again, I am no professional, but I do have some training in this, and I want to share with you some of the signs of depression. There are different types of depression. Major depression, that's having symptoms almost every day of being sad and struggling to sleep and struggling to work, struggling to eat and enjoy life. It it can become persistent depression, which means it's a constant thing. You don't feel like doing anything, and it goes on and on for months, even years. And then if you're a new mom out there, maybe you've had this before. Postpartum depression, that's a real thing, ladies and gentlemen. It's very serious. These are feelings of extreme sadness and anxiety and exhaustion. It makes it difficult to take care of yourself and and take care of your child and, and the rest of the family. And this is a real thing that women deal with all the time. And then you got folks going through psychotic depression. I mean, they see hallucinations and they 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 experience some form of psychosis. And they can't seem to get past that. They see things. They have these these visions. And then some people have seasonal depression. I've gone through some of that. Maybe you have too. It's characterized by the onset of depression during the winter months when there's less natural sunlight. That depression gradually lifts as the sun comes out in the spring and in the summer. But during that winter time, it's tough. You withdraw You sleep more. You may gain some weight. You know, you might be in hibernation like a bear, so to speak, and it's seasonal. And then there's bipolar disorder. Now, that's different from depression, but it's included in my list today because somebody with bipolar disorder, they experience an extreme episode of being in a low mood. We would call that, you know, just a manic mood, sad. You don't know what you're going to get from them. And then they have that euphoric mood. You know, they're like Jojo the Clown. Hey! You know, they're excited. And then the next moment, they're sad again. They're flat. They're they're blunted. There's no expression on the face. It's Jekyll and Hyde. There are people that experience that every day. There are some people right now that are hearing this message. You have it, but you've not been diagnosed with it. It's for real. I'm telling you. So, Stephen, you know, this is practical what you're telling us here. What are the signs? What's the symptoms for depression? Well, if you have persistent anxiety and your mood is always empty, you don't really feel anything, you don't really care about anybody else, you have these feelings of hopelessness, you know, worthlessness, you don't feel like you're good enough, you feel like you're worthless, you know, you're always irritable, angry, upset, you have loss of interest, pleasure, hobbies, you don't want to even travel, you don't want to go outside. You have decreased energy. You're, you're fatigued all the time and just, oh, I just feel so tired. Uh, is it vitamin D? What do I need? Do I need some vitamins? Do I need to order that stuff, you know, that those baseball players use? I don't, what's going on with me? You have that continual struggle. You're moving around very slow. You have difficulty remembering and concentrating and, and getting your schoolwork done and your job done and, and being what you need to be for your family and your spouse. Your appetite changes. Your, your weight's up and down. You, you have thoughts all the time of suicide. You know, would they even miss me? Do I even matter? Suicide can even lead, not suicide can lead to terrible things, but depression can lead to health issues. It can. 
cramps and heart issues and physical disorders, it can lead to that. You know, when I'm providing pastoral care to folks who exhibit signs of depression, many times their, their mental status can be characterized as they're worried, they're anxious all the time, they're preoccupied, their, their behavior is restricted, they're, they're holding back, they won't tell you anything, they won't, they won't say anything, they won't answer any questions, they're delusional. I've encountered people who have a flat emotional effect. That means there's just no emotion whatsoever. They need prompting. They need help. They need encouragement. It's tough. Many folks going through sadness and depression, you know, they're just negative. They're, they're withdrawn. They're, they're defensive. And then there are times when they just need you to listen to them and not say anything and let them open up and just sit with them in the stillness of that place that they're at. You might say, well, how can I help, Stephen? How can I help somebody that's depressed? Because right now we can't get out and see the doctor. Right now we can't get out and see the therapist. We're, we're stuck inside. What can we do? Let me tell you this. Offer support, understanding, and patience. Understand that they may be going through something that you can't even imagine. You know, give them the benefit of the doubt because all of us are going through something different right now. We've never faced anything like this. You know what I'm saying? Never ignore someone when they're talking about suicide. Never ignore that, okay? It's important that you know how to deal with that. And I don't have the time to go through all of that, but I think it's necessary for me to say this. If you know somebody that's in a crisis, get them help quickly. Call their health care professional. Call 911. You know, go to the nearest emergency room. If you're going through something right now where you feel like, I don't want to live anymore, I don't want to be here anymore, I want you to call toll-free the 24-hour hotline of the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. You'll get someone no matter when you call. It's open 24 hours a day, and they care about you. I care about you. We care about you. When somebody around you is struggling with life, don't assume you know why. Reach out and inquire. Talk to them. Ask them some open-ending questions. You know, how do you feel? Where do you go for comfort? Where do you go for peace? How can I help you? What can I do for you? How can I pray for you? And if you offer to pray for them, pray for them right there. Don't say, I'll be praying for you. When I get home today, I'll pray for you. You know how often we get on Facebook and Instagram and on and say, I'm praying. You don't really do it, do you? Why don't you go ahead and make a comment and, and pray right there? Put your comment there. Pray in that comment. Let them know what your prayer is and pray right then and there. Call them up. Say, I want to I pray for you on the phone. I'm going to put it on speakerphone. And I've got others in my household that want to pray for you too. We can be doing that right now. We can be helping each other through this dark cloud of separation right now. Coming together, that's what it's about. And that's what God would have us to do. You know, if we can't help, if we can't help somebody going through something, let's share with others our journey or our resources that might help. You know, I think it's helpful for you to say, you know, I've, I've had some turmoil with my boss at work. I've gone through some separation and anxiety too. You know, I've lost a child. I've struggled with divorce. I've had addiction in my life too. I've faced pain and despair and rejection. To share that with someone else and be able to use what's happened to you and transpired with you to help somebody else, especially when you're on the other side of that darkness, that situation. We can help each other. We can counsel each other peer to peer. We could have assured the two disciples in Luke 24 that while their world had been turned upside down, there were also many in Jerusalem who had no idea what Jesus or they had been through. Let us be proactive in our faith. You know, life today is different. There was a time when life was a lot slower, wasn't it? Where we smelled the roses and we smelled the coffee and we, we observed what was going on around us. But life today, it's a culture of hurry. And this pandemic has forced us to slow down and many people don't like it. They don't like having to slow down. They don't like having to work from home. They don't like having to stay in their home. They don't like having to look at each other in the face and talk with their family members. But yet there's beauty in that, isn't there? getting to know each other all over again, and again, counseling each other and praying with, uh, with each other. But we don't take time to come out of this noise of the chaos, and we need to. 
The disciples had come out of that noise of the chaos of the crucifixion and the screaming and the yelling and the mocking. And when Jesus revealed himself to the disciples, they had a new response, a new understanding, a burning in their hearts, a sudden change of plans. And I believe Jesus Christ can do the same thing for you, even in your darkness, even in your despair. I believe he can make a way through that depressive state that you're facing right now. And here's how. Listen to this. These disciples, they encountered the resurrected Jesus, and instantly they felt encouraged. Instantly they became overjoyed. Their original need to be in a mess, it seems irrelevant. The greater need, even late in the evening after a long seven-day, seven-hour walk, is to hurry the seven miles back to Jerusalem to share the story, to be together with the other disciples, to see what this new thing might mean for all of them. These two disciples, they moved from grief and hopelessness, despair, depression, confusion. They moved to energy and burning in their hearts and an urgency. They were excited again. They wanted to live again. And that's what Jesus does. He resurrects us. The death that's there, the despair that's there, the darkness is there. He brings in light. He brings in a powerful infusion of his Holy Spirit. I can't even explain it to you. It's, it's incomprehensible. It's inconceivable. But when you experience it, you come alive and you can't hardly contain yourself. Like I can't hardly contain myself right now because he's speaking through me to you to hear that everything is going to be okay. He's got you. He's got you in the palm of his hand. He's holding you. You're his child. And he never stops working. He never gives up on you. These disciples, they had been given a resurrected love. They realized that hope was the cure. Hope has a name, and that name is Jesus. And they experienced that hope in the flesh, true reality. So how do you respond to a love that resurrects you? These disciples had been resurrected. They met the resurrected Jesus. How do you respond to that love that resurrects you? You know, our life can be full, overflowing with all our expectations and all our assumptions, shattered when those expectations are broken, confused trying to make sense of of loss and grief, and then suddenly, unexpectedly, from a surprising source, we are redeemed We get a phone call. We get a text. We get a rose delivered to us by someone for Mother's Day saying, Happy Mother's Day. I love you. I care about you. And that's what our church has done. All the mothers in our congregation, we tried to get to all of them. We're going to get to them at least by Mother's Day and hand deliver them a rose. Our youth are even doing that to say, I care about you and I love you and thank you for being a mother. Encouraging one another texting somebody just to let them know you're there. How's it going? May I pray for you? That's what, it's about. That's what it's about. You know, we're not part of a church that practices spiritual malpractice. You know what that means? That means offering Jesus the healer without the people, the places, and the processes to bring hope and healing. And so the church has left the building. The church is everywhere. The church is going neighborhood and, and houses and everywhere we can go to share that hope and that love of Jesus Christ. As a church, we pray together, we break bread together, we care for each other, and we help meet the needs around us. And if that means we need to make 6,000 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, we will do it. That's a small price to pay to make sure people are given hope and that their stomachs are full. You know, the people in this congregation, they know what it means to take the light out into the world. I want you to know what it means. And that's what happened with these disciples. It was dark. It was depressing. And then Jesus came on the scene. And instantly, there was life. You know, the early church was a movement of people, not a building. Did you know that? It didn't start in a building. It didn't start in some amphitheater somewhere or some hall. It was just people, a movement of people. The people gathered, and then came the building, and then the Lord added to their number daily Can we also feel our hearts burning within us? Can we welcome the stranger and acknowledge we need to hear more? The prophet tells us that the Lord's ways are not our ways, and if we will see beyond our circumstances and go beyond our present thought patterns, we will begin to have a vision of what he's doing in our lives. Without his vision, my vision is nothing, but without his vision, I will perish. 
and you will too. We need his vision. We are meant to grow. His way of doing things is far beyond ours. His light is more powerful than any darkness around us. His truth is much stronger than any spirit of error that could attempt to lead us astray. The Holy Spirit is greater than the spirit of the evil one who tempts to deviate us from God's best. And that's what he's doing right now through your depression, through your sadness, through your isolation. You see, the Lord's blood and spirit work together in our living bodies to keep us having his perspective as we encounter the trials of earth. God calls us to do more than we think we can do or should do. God called Abraham, Moses, Esther, Mary, and a whole host of other Bible characters to do more than they ever thought possible. He's calling us all, not just Misty Creek, but all of us around the world to do more as his church, as his body, the body of Christ in motion. He's calling us to see beyond and go beyond just our present circumstance. He's calling us to draw people to him. He's releasing what he's put inside of me, and he'll do the same for you if you'll open up your eyes and recognize and acknowledge him as your Savior and your King. He's been walking with you since the very moment of conception. At the right time, at the right place, God is going to release you. This church and churches around the world, this community and this country, this world from the darkness that seems to have overcome it. But it has not. You see, darkness and evil and Satan, the enemy, has been defeated by the light. Almighty God through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you and I have that spirit within us right now. Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. He'll use you, ladies and gentlemen. He'll use you in a mighty way. From whatever has cursed this land and caused division and confusion... I want you to know that God is not a God of division. He's not a God of confusion. He will use you to confuse the enemy, though. He will do that. We're going to be, during this pandemic, we're finding out that we're going to be freed from the earthly things that have enslaved us, whether it's sports, whether it's TV, whatever it is, eating out, all the things that enslave us, that take all of our time from each other, and especially from God, he's going to set us free, and he's going to take us to a place beyond all of that. So I want you to take a deep breath. We're going to that place. And before you go to bed tonight, whatever you're depressed about, whatever you're worried about, whatever your anxiety is, I want you to sit on the edge of that bed. I want you to hold out your hands like this. And I want you to say, God, I give you all my anxiety, my sadness, my depression. And I want you to breathe deep the breath of God. And I want you to breathe out all that stuff and give it to him. And say, Holy Spirit, I'm going to rest in you tonight. With you, I'm going to sleep tonight. For the first time in weeks and months. I want you to try that starting tonight. Do it every night for the rest of your life. It is an antidote. It is a panacea. It is a cure-all. To release everything to the King of Kings. And He will give you rest. It's vital. It's vital that we know. He's calling us to something that we never thought possible. It's vital that we each understand how God is orchestrating our paths to reach people for Christ beyond our doors. That's why here at Misty Creek, our services never end. We're just beginning. Can we welcome the Holy Spirit? Can we say without reservation, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Lord, your presence. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Do you want to experience the glory of God's goodness right now? Do you want to receive that promise of eternity? Do you know that you are good enough because he's more than enough? If you want to know who Jesus Christ is and make the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life, greater than the car you're going to buy, the person you're going to marry, the house you're going to live in, your retirement, your vacation home, greater than all of that, the greatest decision is to surrender your entire life to Jesus. I invite you to do that right now just by saying these simple words from your heart. Jesus, 
I need you. I love you. Forgive me of my sins when I fall short of who you created me to be. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Make room in my heart. There is room in my heart for you, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, save me. Jesus, I receive you today as my Savior, as my King. I commit to you all that I am. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Here at Mystic Creek, we believe if you prayed that prayer, you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. We want to know if you've made that decision today. You'll see up on the monitor or on your TV, you'll see that there's a number there. We want you to text us at that number. If you've received Jesus Christ into your heart, we're going to walk alongside you. If you've got a prayer request, something heavy on your heart, we want you to share that with us today. Send us a text. We love to respond and connect with you. We love you and we care about you. Just know this, that the Holy Spirit is with you right now. He's making a way when you thought there was no way. He set you apart. He's given you new life. You are a new creation in Christ. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. I'm not.